EV sales are slowing. In August 2023, it took about twice as long to sell an EV in the U.S. as it did the previous January. Consumers generally still have a little bit of anxiety, both about range and some of the know-how when it comes to EVs. The mainstream appeal of these cars is still not there. They're still too expensive and they've got too many limitations in terms of how you use them. I've been in the auto industry 40 years, and I've never seen this kind of investment. $6.5 billion strictly dedicated to EVs. Wedbush says spending on commercial EVs should top $1.2 trillion between now and 2030. We're building the future of the electric vehicle. In 2022, consumers spent nearly $400 billion on electric cars worldwide. The U.S. is expected to add 1 million new EVs to its roads in 2023. And from 2023 to 2027, automotive companies have committed $616 billion in total investments. Meanwhile, these efforts have hit an unnerving speed bump. EV sales are slowing. I was a little nervous about going all EV uh, because my husband has an EV as well. Uh, and to have two EVs in the house, you know, it's challenging. I think the main issue is the long distance travel. Yep. We've been kind of in that situation. You do have to plan. Yes. In August 2023, it took about twice as long to sell an EV in the U.S. as it did the previous January. Gas-burning vehicles were still selling briskly. While slightly more than half of consumers say EVs are the future and will eventually replace combustion engines, less than a third of dealers say so. You have a product that almost every automaker has hinged their future on. The government is really saying, look, we got to go with electrification. But when the rubber meets the road, when people have to make that decision and a lot of money's involved, we're starting to see that that's starting to take a bit of a hit. Tesla has slashed prices dramatically. Sales at some EV startups have disappointed. And companies like Ford have ramped up hybrid production as demand for their EVs has leveled off. So what is really going on? And why? And what does it mean for the future? For those who are in combustion, would you suggest taking the step as the bridge, so to speak, to mm -hmm. a PHEV, mm -hmm. a plug-in hybrid? Or do you think perhaps going right over that to an electric vehicle? Mm -hmm. There is a oversupply of electric vehicles in the industry today that is greater than the demand. This is Jeff Iosa. His shop is one of 383 Mercedes-Benz dealerships around the U.S. It pulls in about $40 million a year, employs about 50 people, and at any given time keeps about 70 cars on the lot. About a third are EVs and hybrids. It's not that the customer is not considering it or entertaining the purchase, it's the reticence to that anxiety that exists relative to the range that the battery can produce and coupled with or compounded by the lack of public charging infrastructure. We're perhaps moving a little bit too fast. Cox Automotive said in July 2023, on average, there's a 52-day supply of ICE vehicles at dealerships. If they stopped making cars today, a dealer would have enough to last 52 days. Pickup trucks went from 52 days to turn in January 2023 to just 57 by August. Meanwhile, the EV supply was closer to 90 to 100 days. No segment has seen a rise as substantial as EVs. There's definitely a rise in, you know, how long a vehicle is going to sell a lot. It's just that the EVs are sitting even longer. Um, and the fact that we're seeing it reflected in the used car market as well, that tells us this isn't just like an isolated incident. This is something that is very targeted. Numbers elsewhere suggest enthusiasm for EVs has dampened from a pandemic era high. In 2021, 86% of U.S. buyers were considering an EV. That number has since fallen to 67% in 2023. 
In May 2021, Ford opened reservations for its F-150 Lightning, the fully electric version of the most popular vehicle in America. It closed them by the end of the year because the company said it had enough reservations for three years' worth of production. But by September 2023, Ford said it was ramping up production of its hybrid F-150 because sales of the Lightning had slowed. We literally had people who would follow car carriers to the store, hoping that when it got here that the car on the carrier that they wanted to buy was available, only to learn that it was already sold. People are rushing to the dealership, they're going bananas paying over MSRP, their bidding wars are going on, people are like, I, I hope that guy doesn't buy it, if it falls off the truck I'll buy it kind of attitude. I mean, just completely by the wayside now. It's just been one year and the market for EVs is upside down. The softening of sales isn't just happening for legacy brands. The buzzed about luxury EV brand Lucid has seen two consecutive quarters of weaker than expected demand. Most recently, it delivered 600 fewer of its high performance 500 mile range luxury air sedan than Wall Street had expected in the second quarter of 2023. There are larger economic challenges. Interest rates are up, and so borrowing money is a lot more expensive. Inflation has reduced purchasing power, and supply chains are disrupted. The inflexible nature of the EV supply chain is pressuring OEMs to make EVs despite consumer pullbacks. Then there are the pressures of meeting government mandates. Think of the lens of the manufacturer where it typically takes a cycle time of upwards of seven or eight years from inception to showroom floor and wheels rolling, right? So that's a big ship to turn. And when back to the mandates, the regulatory pressures, when you have to meet those, it's not like you can just throw a switch and convert from combustion to electric. There is a specific pricing challenge with EVs. They tend to be more expensive than their gasoline counterparts. That may explain why the luxury category hasn't slowed down as much as EVs have. A luxury mid-size electric crossover, say, will often have a higher transaction price or even a higher sticker price than a comparable fuel-burning one in the same class. The average transaction price for a vehicle in the US was about $48,000 in September 2023. The average transaction price for an EV was somewhere between $53,000 and nearly $60,000, depending on whose data you use. Meanwhile, the EV buyer is changing. Drury says about 40% of EV shoppers are trading in a vehicle they already own for a new one. That is about twice what it was a decade ago. That suggests that a lot of those EVs purchased a decade ago were supplemental vehicles, an extra car. Like if you had a two car garage, you got a third. And part of that was because those EVs, they qualified for lots of tax credits. You got HOV access lane. Oh, I know in Southern California, that was such a huge thing that vehicles with that sticker, they would sell at a premium. As a Mercedes dealer, Jeff Iosa still interacts with a lot of well-heeled customers. Even he has seen evidence of this. The early adopters were very techy and they were very, I want to say more in the space of luxury. Last year, we had 30-something models in the marketplace to almost 90-plus models today, a more mainstream buyer. So these are the chargers for mm -hmm. uh, fast charge, mm -hmm. DC charging, and home charging. Mm -hmm. IOSA sells an EQB, a more mainstream priced EV that retails somewhere in the high $50,000 range. It's not cheap, but it's only slightly above the average vehicle transaction price, and it's a lot less expensive than the EQE, which can run above $90,000, and the EQS, which can run up to $140,000. These vehicles won't be worth nearly as much as, say, an ICE equivalent, which has more certainty involved. You know, there's not going to be leaps and bounds of technology and improvements in ICE vehicles, but we know there will be with EVs. Batteries, on average, are warranted for 10 years to give at least 80% efficiency. That's not the case with ICE. ICE cars, everybody puts out a good car today and they last well over 20 years. I think there's a, an evolving sense of buyer remorse. You see this in televisions where, you know, every six to nine months you feel like the same 52 inch TV 
is cheaper at Best Buy or you know, pick your location for the same functionality. And you know, especially now that OEMs are lowering prices. At the end of the second quarter, 2023, several automakers announced that they're moving to the Tesla charging standard, also known as the North American charging standard or NACS. That means there are vehicles stuck on factory floors with an obsolescing charging outlet. Charging is a sore spot for all types of buyers, whether current, past, or prospective. This EV will allow you to plot a course mm -hmm. and determine and predetermine when you arrive at different charging stations. Then there is the government. There's a fair amount of feedback that we get from customers that say, you know, we just don't like the government telling us what we should buy. By 2032, 67.5% battery electric is aggressive. I think by 2035, all electric is aspirational. I don't think that that's going to happen. EVs sitting on lots does not necessarily equal waning demand. EVs made up a record 8% of U.S. vehicle sales through early September 2023. If we looked at EVs as, as their own segment, we took everything and put it together, it'd be the number six segment in the industry. So it's not as if nobody wants them, there's no demand. However, there is a tremendous degree of regional variation. While there have always been regional stories in auto, pickup trucks in Texas, luxury cars in the Northeast, EV adoption rates pretty closely track two economic metrics, pump prices and home energy rates. If gas prices get up to close to $6 like they are in most parts of California, we're going to see a lot of consumers there shifting toward, uh, toward EVs. Meanwhile, in Texas, gasoline prices are almost $2 a gallon cheaper in Texas than they are in California. But there is another reason why inventories have been building. Tesla, which dominates the EV market, has been hacking away at its prices. In August 2023, Cox Automotive data showed the average price paid for an electric vehicle was $53,376, down from $53,633 in July 2023, and down from more than $65,000 a year prior. Again, that decline is driven almost entirely by Tesla. In August, Model 3 transaction prices were down 21% year over year, while Model S was down 17%, Model Y dropped 16%, and Model X was down 13%. At the beginning of 2023, the Model S was priced at $104,990, and the Model X was priced at $120,990. By September 15th, the price was $79,990 for the X and $74,990 for the S. About two thirds of all EVs sold are Teslas because their prices are so aggressive. So not only do we have uh, fewer consumers looking for an EV in Q2, we actually saw that those that were, it's very hard to get beyond Tesla uh, with their prices and certainly with their supercharger charger network to go buy uh, an alternative. It's an unlevel playing field when you have a manufacturer that sells in the space of vertical integration direct to the consumer and not use the franchise system. It gives some flexibility to that direct seller to be able to adjust their pricing and in, in the case of Tesla, um, conveniently below the threshold so that you can capture more of the incentive money from the government. Meanwhile, automakers are releasing EVs that are often selling for above $50,000. Ford hiked the starting price on its F-150 Lightning in March of 2023 to $60,000, a 50% increase over the original $40,000 starting price. Ford has since cut that to $49,000, but again, that is still $10,000 higher than the automaker had originally planned. It's very expensive to bring EVs to market. In a lot of cases, vehicles that were announced at a certain price point a couple years ago, the automaker has not been able to hold those prices in this market. Um, and so those earlier announced prices have, have tended to creep higher. The picture that starts to emerge, the EVs that are on the lots don't match what consumers want and what dealers are selling. Don't get rid of your combustion car. <laughs> I would like to see the government reassess their regulatory 
crushes and perhaps revisit the incentives through the IRA. EV inventory is going to rise at the same time that the auto industry continues to launch more and more EVs at that fifty to sixty thousand dollar price point, which is already well saturated. There is demand for EVs. It's just that they're Teslas and they're a lot lower priced than what we see. If perhaps we could hit the rewind button and do things differently than we have. I would like to think that maybe we would have slowed things down, maybe been more in the space of hybrid as a bridge to a more perfected battery technology. We have been in the space of combustion ice for over a century. So we have a lot of experience with it. Battery electric is at ground zero. We don't know what we don't know and we're still kind of cutting our teeth with it. Cle clearly, I believe that we've moved a little bit too much and too fast. But there are reasons to be optimistic. The S&P study showed that people were willing to accept charging times of up to an hour and less range on an EV than on an ICE vehicle. That's another shining light for EVs is, again, this understanding that they're not necessarily going to get what they get with their typical ICE vehicle, but they are actually willing to accept something less than what they're getting with their ICE vehicle. And while the number of buyers considering an EV did fall from 2021 to 2023, it is still higher than it was in 2019. The analogy that I like to use is we all have smartphones today, and most of us had flip phones. And if I said to you, give me your smartphone and I'm going to give you back a flip phone, it would be like saying, give me your EV, I'm gonna give you back a combustion. And I would say that 90 plus percent of the people, including myself would say, I'm good. I'm, I'm keeping my smartphone, I'm keeping my electric car. You don't wanna go backwards. Used EV prices are falling. Buyers can get some great deals, but some say it is yet another sign that demand is faltering. Low resale value could also be a major deterrent to EV purchases and EV adoption more broadly. Others say it is just a blip and fears of an EV slowdown are overblown. Studies show that used EV prices fell somewhere around 30% in September and October 2023 from the same period in 2022. Used vehicle prices overall saw declines in the mid-single digits for that time period. The mainstream appeal of these cars is still not there. They're still too expensive and they've got too many limitations in terms of how you use them. People are broke, interest rates are high, the demand for EVs is not the issue, it's its affordability. Some research indicates what many EV supporters insist. EVs are cheaper to own than gasoline burning cars. You don't have to shell out for gas and maintenance costs are lower. But a car's residual or resale value is a big factor in determining the total cost of owning it. The volatility in the used EV market shows how much isn't yet known about EVs, including how to predict what one will be worth in a few years. A single change to policy, battery technology, even a single manufacturer's prices can upset the whole market. These price drops come at a time when many other data points suggest EV demand is stalling. New EVs are collecting dust on dealer lots. Tesla, which controls nearly two thirds of the EV market, has been aggressively cutting prices and its third quarter deliveries fell short of investor expectations. Let me give you this general thought that I hear from everybody in this business, including people at Tesla. This is still new. CNBC looked at data and talked to insiders to determine whether used EV prices are a sign of a larger slowdown in the EV market or a bad investment altogether. One study showed that all used vehicles up to three years old lost 4.8% in value from September 2022 to September 2023, but EVs specifically fell 29.5%. 
Another showed that from October 22 to October 23, the average price for one to five year old used EVs dropped 33.7%. Meanwhile, used car prices only fell 5.1% in the same period. A third showed they had fallen about 32% from September 22 to September 23. That study said the average EV price as of October 18th was $27,863 roughly the same as what it was in early 2021. Some research indicates EVs have the worst depreciation rates of any vehicle type, including, by a narrow margin, big value losers like luxury vehicles. Hybrids are doing extremely well in holding their value, and EVs are doing extremely poor. Why is that? Because when you buy a hybrid, what do you get? You get much higher fuel efficiency in a higher fuel priced world we live in, and zero range anxiety. That's a powerful, desirable combination the trouble is not limited to the used market. In January 2023, new car dealers had about 52 days worth of EVs and internal combustion cars. But internal combustion inventory held pretty steady between 52 days and 58 days throughout the year, while EV inventory soared to 111 days in early July, then settled at 97 days by October. These numbers have fueled concerns that demand for EVs is waning. But not everyone agrees, and there has been a fierce debate over what's actually happening. There's been this wave of what I would call pretty misleading headlines over the last few weeks. Like you would think that EVs were dead and buried if you paid attention just to what the news headlines were. Scott Case is CEO of Recurrent, which creates vehicle history reports specifically designed to measure EV battery life. It also publishes the Recurrent Price Index, which tracks used EV sales. That index is among those showing prices have fallen dramatically. If you wanted to say what's the single biggest cause of used EV price drops, it's Elon Musk. Tesla controls about 60% of the new EV car market. And in 2023, the company started a price war. That drove a lot of customers who would buy used EVs toward new ones, especially Teslas. It also forced a lot of other manufacturers to lower their prices as well, and the timing corresponds pretty tightly with the Tesla price drops. Many of the 2022 models recurrent tracks depreciated 20 to 40 percent over 2023. Nobody's going to pay the same for a used car as they would for the new alternative. So um, you saw an immediate drop in used Tesla prices, which then was followed by a like a time delayed drop in the used prices for Tesla competitors. In other words, plummeting EV values don't reflect some kind of inherent problem with EVs, just the fact that consumers who might otherwise buy used are opting for new Teslas instead. In addition, 2023 is the three year anniversary of the Tesla Model Y, which in the third quarter of the year was the best selling EV in the US. Three-year-old cars are a kind of benchmark in the used market. Leased vehicles are often held for a period of three years, and a large share of the cars on the used market are vehicles coming off lease. Recurrent has found that on average, new EV owners hold onto their cars for about three to four years before selling. That means a lot of 2020 Model Ys are entering the used market, driving up inventory. 2018, 2019 was just an incredible step up in new EV production in the US, Tesla, but all other manufacturers as well. And so that's what we're now seeing kind of come onto the used market at scale. Used EV sales now outpace the sales of all new EV models except the Model Y and dwarf the sales of most of them. They do, however, make up only a tiny share of total used sales, about 1%. Finally, new federal tax credits kicked in in 2023. These replaced the EV credits that had been in place since 2009. The original plan offered buyers a $7,500 credit for each of the first 200,000 EVs a manufacturer sold. The new credits offered the same amount of money, but introduced a few new conditions. Centering on the price of the vehicle, the buyer's income, battery capacity, and where the car is assembled, among other things. January 1st of 2023, the $7,500 tax credit appeared on the scene for uh, new cars. So the immediate impact was essentially dollar for dollar $7,500 decreases in used prices. Like right at January 1st for any car that was sort of getting eligibility for this new credit. In April 2021, there were about 11,000 used vehicles on U.S. dealer lots and on dealer or manufacturer websites. That doesn't include private sellers. 
By October 2023, there were three times that. Two concepts to keep in mind. Residual value is what a car is expected to be worth at the end of some term, a lease, financing period, subscription, rental, or something else. It is often based on the price the car would be expected to fetch on a wholesale market, like a dealer auction. Resale value is what a car is likely to be worth once you sell it on the retail market. Used EV prices matter because residual value and resale value are factors in determining the total cost of owning a vehicle. Tesla has long argued that its cars have a lower cost of ownership than comparably priced internal combustion vehicles when you include gas prices, which EV owners don't have to worry about, and maintenance costs, which tend to be lower, as EVs have fewer moving parts. Calculating cost to own is complex and varies tremendously depending on insurance costs, gasoline prices, and electricity rates, among other things. In its 2023 five-year cost to own rankings, Kelly Blue Book said the Tesla Model 3 had the lowest cost of ownership in the luxury car category. The also electric Polestar 2 came in second. What matters is that this idea that we're going to all be driving electric vehicles in a relatively short time frame, three, four, six years, this latest six months and what's gone on with electric cars really puts that into question in my mind. The reality is that EV sales growth, both on the new and the used side, is vastly outstripping combustion engine sales growth. Case cites several statistics. From September 2022 to September 2023, new U.S. vehicle sales on the combustion side rose 13%. New U.S. EV sales rose almost 60%. Sales of used EVs were up 40%. Used combustion cars fell 2%. But skeptics say that doesn't cover the full story. Remember, there are three types of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. On the one hand, sales are growing, but in the new market, it is taking longer to sell an EV than a gasoline car. And in the used market, prices are falling more dramatically. Elon wanted to hit a certain sales each of his quarters this past year, and he was dropping his prices to do that, and he still didn't hit his sales. What do falling prices and not hitting your sales goals mean? They mean people are not buying the cars at the rate that you thought they would. EV sales are not growing uniformly across the country. Some evidence suggests that states with the highest share of EVs, like California, Oregon, and Washington, are also the slowest growing markets. Brower says there might be a kind of natural ceiling for EV demand, somewhere between 7 to 10 percent of the market. But other data suggest EV sales are still growing steadily in many of these places. EVs tend to cost more than gasoline counterparts. Even with Tesla's price cuts and EV subsidies for at least some models, new EVs often have higher sticker prices. Public charging is something that people worry about. If I don't have a Tesla, where am I going to charge it? La la la. Well, you know, something somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of people just charge at home most of the time. I think people and the government need to embrace the reality that electric cars have some advantages and they can serve a role in personal transportation. They cannot be the solution and serve the role in personal transportation until some big problems are solved. In 2024, what is now a tax credit that needs to be filed on a tax return will become a point of sale rebate. $7,500 on a new EV and $4,000 on a used EV. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a coming surge in both categories starting in January when someone can basically get cash in their pocket right at point of sale rather than having to wait, you know, what essentially would be 18 months to file their taxes and have a reduction in their tax liability. But for people who have bought a new EV in 2023, there might be another hitch to pay attention to three years down the road. The terms for the $7,500 tax credit on new EVs in 2023 were tightened considerably. If you're buying an EV, you would have to fit certain eligibility requirements. For example, the car has to be below a certain sticker price and assembled in the US, among other things. However, there was a workaround. A manufacturer could still offer the credit if the buyer leased the vehicle. The lease rates on those cars have just absolutely skyrocketed this year, which is the interesting sort of knock-on effect in the used market is that means that 
um, three years from now, a ton of them start showing up in the used market. Skeptics like Carl Brower think that more will really need to change before the used car market looks more like its internal combustion counterpart. They need to cost as much as combustion engines, they need to travel as far as combustion engines, and they need to refuel as quickly as combustion engines. When EVs can do those three things, why would you not buy an EV? In addition, larger economic factors like high interest rates would need to change. The factors that are in place, which is a budding oversupply of new EVs, which is making them less valuable and pushing their prices down, and economic concerns and high interest rates, I don't see any of those changing in the next few months. So there's no reason to believe, in the near term at least, that you would suddenly see a reverse in used EV pricing. A spike in gas prices could also spur demand, but under certain conditions. Interest in hybrids and EVs tends to rise when gas prices are rising, but level off when prices settle, even if the price is high. Understanding the used EV market and EV depreciation presents serious challenges. First, the data set is small. As mentioned, only a tiny share of all used cars are EVs. Second, because the market is still new and the technology changes rapidly, there are still unknowns. Battery technology is one such area. It's something people worry about because they're like, you know, my iPhone's down to 80% after two years. What's going to happen to my car? So it's one of these things that may be more of a consumer perception thing in real life. I mean, what we're seeing with Tesla's is the batteries do tend to go seven or eight years and are still pretty good at the end of that. The short story on battery longevity is that EV batteries are holding up better than people's expectations. It is not the case that an EV is an iPhone with wheels on it. It doesn't work the same way. But there is variability between different cars of the same make, model, and year, and that's especially true as vehicles age. So if you start out with a car that has a range of 250 miles, after five years, it could have a range of 200 or 220, depending on how it's used, how it's charged, you know, what weather conditions it's exposed to. A simple change in federal tax credit rules can lead to a flood of used vehicles three years down the road. And just one manufacturer, Tesla, can move the entire market just by changing prices on its website. This is still a new market. We are still figuring out how EVs at scale work. We are still figuring out how charging at scale works. It's all these little things. People are doing this stuff for the first time. Used EVs that aren't Teslas are a new thing. To some extent, used Teslas are still a new thing. And we're all still learning how this is gonna work. It's all still emerging. Tesla uh, on the company's new agreement with car rental giant Hertz. A few months out of bankruptcy, uh, says it's going to order 100,000 Tesla Model 3s. Those purchases, total value of about $4.2 billion. In October 2021, Hertz publicly announced it intended to buy 100,000 Tesla vehicles. Shares of both companies soared. Check out shares of Tesla soaring to all-time highs today, launching the company into the trillion-dollar club for the first time. First mover advantage aside, it would help Hertz distinguish itself in an industry plagued by commoditization, where the color of a brand's signage seems to be the only differentiator. If you or I went to the airport and we went to the green counter, the red counter, or the yellow counter, we're still going to get the same white Toyota Camry. But only a couple of years in, while the rental company is posting strong finances, its EV strategy is facing some serious challenges. Pricing troubles, skyrocketing repair costs, and low resale values. There's no technology change, EVs included, that run a straight line without some hiccups and challenges. And that's this. The line from A to B is not always straight. Meanwhile, big rental rivals hung back on EVs. Hertz's investors are divided over what to do next, either kill or at least pause the EV initiative or try to find a way to make it work. Hertz, a more than century old rental company, filed for bankruptcy in May 2020 as demand for rentals dried up during the coronavirus pandemic. Even before the pandemic, Hertz had a number of challenges. Sales grew from about $7.6 billion in 2010 to a peak of about $11 billion in 2014, but fell to about $9.8 billion in 2019. 
Pre-bankruptcy, the stock had been highly volatile, climbed as high as $109.48 in 2014, and sank as low as $3.07 the day before Hertz filed. In addition to the Hertz rental brand, with stands at airports or parking garages, the company has a number of other businesses, including car sales, truck, van, and equipment rentals, and a leasing division. It also acquired the Dollar and Thrifty brands in 2012. The company operates in 160 countries and jurisdictions around the world. 13 months after filing for Chapter 11, the company emerged from bankruptcy, unveiling big plans. When you're coming out of a process like that, you need a story to tell investors. Uh, people want to know what your, what your strategy is, what's going to be different this time. Some moves were expected, securing more corporate accounts, like a big partnership with American Express, cleaning up its dollar and thrifty brands, which had suffered from underinvestment, and a pledge to focus more on cost efficiency. But the big move was its plan to buy 100,000 Teslas, mostly Model 3 sedans, for its U.S. and European operations. It also planned to set up about 3,000 fast chargers for 65 markets. Both Tesla and Hertz share prices popped on the news. Hertz jumped 10% over the previous close, and over the course of the next week rose another whopping 29%. Tesla shares rose 12.7% on the day over the previous close, and then another 14.4% through November 2nd, the day Tesla CEO Elon Musk took to Twitter to break some news. They didn't have a fleet deal. They didn't have a special contract with Tesla. And Elon Musk let all the excitement kind of go viral before he, one week later, clarified that Hertz didn't have a fleet contract with Tesla. He added that he was surprised by the stock pop since he thought the Hertz deal has had zero effect on Tesla's economics. According to its 2022 10K, Hertz has large-scale acquisition agreements with Tesla, Polestar, and General Motors, but the company neither denied nor confirmed the details with CNBC. At the time of the filing, the goal was to convert one quarter of Hertz's fleet to electric. Hertz doesn't break out the amount of money it spends on EVs, but we can make some assumptions. In 2022, the company ended the year with 428,700 vehicles in the Americas and 118,700 international. 9% of its fleet, or about 49,266 vehicles, were Teslas. This isn't perfect, but if you assume Hertz paid about $50,000 on average for each Tesla, as some analysts who follow the company think, that would be about $2.5 billion in Tesla vehicles alone. That doesn't include any other infrastructure or expenses Hertz had to undertake in 2022. Overall, globally, it spent $10.6 billion on new vehicles that year. This EV strategy really was the one that kind of took off and Hertz became, I guess, kind of affiliated with that. That became kind of their calling card uh, in the market and, and something that a lot of folks kind of kind of latched onto and said, hey, this seems like a really interesting story. I'm going to follow this. These three car rental firms control about 95% of the market. Hertz was the only one to make an EV push this big. Hertz's intention was to be a first mover. The industry has received some pressure to green its fleets and the idea was that it would help its corporate customers too. Large organizations around the globe uh, really uh, are interested in uh, choosing EVs for their employees. It really helps them to meet their own ESG goals. And we see a lot of um, you know, corporate demand both here in North America as well as in Europe. Hertz also saw an opportunity to introduce EVs to ordinary consumers who might be curious but reluctant to commit to a purchase outright. In the leisure space, there is also a lot of organic demand, uh, certainly for customers who are perhaps curious about whether or not an EV would fit with their lifestyle. And so choosing an electric vehicle like a test drive uh, is something that we see. And we see uh, situations where Customers are choosing, you know, an EV both for long road trips um, as well as for, you know, short, shorter drives. In 2016, Hertz struck a partnership with Uber to start renting out fuel-burning vehicles to rideshare drivers. Hertz considered the electrification of rideshare a fast-approaching requirement, not merely an option. 
New York City's Green Rides program requires 100% of rideshare trips to be either zero emissions or wheelchair accessible by 2030. Despite an investment of at least $2.5 billion, the expected demand from corporate and private customers has not materialized. Consumers generally, um, you know, still have a little bit of anxiety, both about range and some of the, you know, know-how when it comes to EVs. Uh, and to that end, that has really informed our strategy uh, around building resource and really helping with that challenge. Demand that did arise tended to come from customers who were already Tesla or EV owners. What has worked, sort of, is the ride-sharing segment of the business. As of December 2022, 65 to 70% of the EVs in Hertz's fleet were utilized by rideshare drivers. They didn't want those things sitting around. They're very expensive cars. And so it made all the sense in the world to Hertz, right, to, to say, hey, we're, we're going to extend, essentially, extend our, our normal rideshare rental program, and we're going to throw Teslas into it and other EVs. I mean, I think from my perspective, Hertz and Uber has been a great partnership. I think that Uber really needs Hertz and Hertz really needs Uber. Harry Campbell is the founder and CEO of The Rideshare Guy, a website and podcast dedicated to Uber and Lyft drivers and other gig economy workers. There's really no better use case in my mind than an Uber driver who's going to put 1,500 miles a week on their car to not only rent a car, but to rent an electric vehicle. Renting to rideshare companies is cost effective. There's a one week minimum and costs of turning a vehicle are substantially cut. The challenge, though, is that Hertz gets about $43 per day, rather than the $75 to $90 it gets for a consumer or corporate rental. There's also been a disproportionate number of accidents. While Hertz says routine maintenance costs on EVs are lower, the cost of repairing the damage from accidents is twice what it would be for an internal combustion vehicle. This is partly a Tesla problem. A lot of their critics will say, meaning, They've grown the number of vehicles on the road without investing enough service centers and over-reliance on their mobile service fleet to fix those vehicles. And so you'll see these long wait times to get you know, spare parts put into the cars. You'll see long wait times to even get an appointment. That's, that's only one tiny piece of why EVs are expensive to repair. In order to buffer some of the higher repair costs, the rental giant has taken on more of them in-house while also negotiating for cheaper parts. Hertz expects costs will drop over time. However, repair costs have not come down as fast as the company had expected. In another move to try to limit damage and repair costs, the company shifted some of its EVs meant for rideshare into its leisure business. But this left a glut of unused cars in that segment and lowered revenue. The collapse of used EV values is another problem. They've fallen about 30% between September 2022 and September 2023. The main reason? Tesla, which controls more than 60% of the new EV market, drastically cut prices on its cars, driving down the value of everything else. This is important because about every two years, rental companies turn cars over to the used market. The MSRPs on the cars Hertz bought has since dropped by about a third. The opportunity to dump the car, so to speak, is not really one that's available to us, and frankly speaking, not one that I would take. There's positive margin to be had in the existing fleet of cars, and we will buy our price down over time as these cars have fallen in price. And by the way, we'll buy more than just Teslas. These companies have to report the depreciation of their assets in their financial statements even before they sell the car. So falling used EV prices hurt Hertz's balance sheets, even for cars that are still in their fleet. Hertz claims that taking into account depreciation, collision, damage, and revenue per vehicle, Hertz's EV fleet is costing the company several EBITDA margin points compared to ICE vehicles. Investors are split over what to do next. Some want Hertz to pause the EV program or abandon it altogether. Others say Hertz should persist. Hertz CEO Stephen Scher, who inherited the EV plan when he took office in February 2022, 
said in the company's 2023 third quarter earnings call that it would be reducing the share of Teslas in Hertz's fleet in favor of those made by GM and other legacy automakers with stronger parts and service networks. In its rideshare business, Hertz is only renting Teslas to more experienced drivers in order to lower the likelihood of damage. I've driven a Tesla for the past seven years. These cars have a lot of power. I'm not going to lie. I almost got into two or three accidents when I first got my Tesla Model 3 because I wasn't used to it. And so I think one cool thing that Hertz is doing now that we've seen is they actually require drivers to have a minimum number of trips. So you can't be a brand new driver and get into a Model 3 anymore, which I think is smart. Cars Hertz had previously shifted to leisure where they languished, are now back in rideshare. Hertz's overall rideshare rental business has grown 50% year over year. The higher rideshare demand has brought the company more revenue per unit, better rented than sitting on the lot. And by reducing the glut in the leisure business, Hertz can resume premium pricing in that segment. We do see really nice demand, uh, certainly across large travel companies, um, hotels and airlines, as well as large associations here in North America. And that's that's a, that's a natural organic uh, demand for these EVs that we see coming through. In 2023, it staged drive events at airports, including the Los Angeles International Airport and Denver International. It does the same on corporate campuses. The company is also putting together instructional videos and other online content to inform customers about driving EVs. Yes, Hertz has also taken a leadership role in building out uh, charging infrastructure, and we have partnered with large energy companies like BP to do exactly that. And, and the objective is to build out large scale, fast charging uh, for the uh, public as well as for our own customers. Um, and we're going to see Giga Hubs uh, appear at airports like Houston uh, and LAX upcoming. Share has also said that cheaper EV prices benefit the company going forward as it continues to acquire them. Overall, Hertz isn't exactly struggling. In the third quarter 2023, it pulled in $2.7 billion in revenue, a record. Gasoline vehicle rentals, which make up more than 85% of Hertz's fleet, are profitable. Overall demand was 16% higher than in the previous quarter. Operating costs are in line with expectations. As inflation starts to subside, some costs are coming down. Billion dollars of EBITDA in 2023, um, and they're still solidly positive, and you know, they, they they still generate ample cash flow. They could potentially buy back stock. So you know, it's not um, it, it's not a case of hey, the company is getting totally um, it, 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 it wiped out or anything by this. It's just it it, it just it's obviously crimping profits. Hertz is not the only company doing well. The whole industry is thriving. The only difference is competitors don't have the pressure of such a large and struggling EV fleet. The hope is that its investments now will give it a leg up over competitors if and when EVs take off in car rental. There are reasons to think it will. It takes at least a year or two to turn over EVs in a fleet. Hertz thinks it might be able to hold on to the cars for three to four years. So Hertz's competitors are not going to be able to match Hertz's EV fleet overnight, nor will they immediately be able to match Hertz's investments in infrastructure.